Well, good morning, everyone. I guess it's time to start. I decided that I would uh, give you your PowerPoint so that you could have it in your hands. <laughs> uh, I find that, uh, you know, when you project it on the screen and when you offer it online, uh, people, uh, probably about a quarter of the people eventually will go online and check it out. So this way you have it in your hands. Can't hear me? Okay, uh, kind of muffled? Yeah? Well, I don't, I don't know whether I can improve it or not. Um, move it higher. How about there? Is that better? Yeah? Okay, a little bit. It still sounds a little bit muffled, doesn't it? Yeah. But, well, you know, I, I don't have the sound technician here, so there's not much that I can do. Well, it's good to have you all here. Uh, we are going to discuss righteousness by faith and the end time crisis or conflict. And uh, in your hands you have uh, some material. Uh, a little bit later on we're going to hand out a sheet for you to write down uh, your email address if you would like to get a fuller document uh, with more information than, than what you have there. What you have there is just the basic information, but uh, we have a, a much larger document that is available uh, and we can send it to you electronically. Uh, we only have an hour and 15 minutes and uh, there's a lot of material to cover and I'm going to just basically follow uh, this handout that you have in your hands. Uh, but let's begin with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to be with us as we study together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being at ASI. What a blessing it is to see so many friends, so many ministries involved in presenting the message of the Adventist Church for these last days. It's comforting to see that so many ministries are being established to share the message with the entire world. Father, we ask that as we study this material this morning that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts, to open our minds, to give us understanding, to give us your wisdom. And we thank you, Father, for your presence because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to follow this material quite closely because uh, we are so limited in time that I want to cover as much of it as possible. If we don't finish, uh, you'll have it in written form so that you can uh, refer to it. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to begin by referring to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Uh, let me give you a little bit of context about this verse. This verse is found in the context of the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. Uh, you're aware of the fact that the plagues uh, fall after the close of probation. But this verse we're going to find does not describe events after the close of probation. This verse is a parenthetical warning uh, stating that you need to prepare before the close of probation so that when this moment of the sixth plague comes you're not caught by surprise. And so well, we're going to take a look at this text um, and I'm just going to read it. Behold, Jesus is speaking, Behold I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You notice that there are six elements there that we're going to take a look at. Now if you look at a red letter edition of the Bible, you'll find that this is the first time that Jesus speaks after the messages to the churches. And he doesn't speak again until Revelation 21 and 22. So this verse is a warning of Christ inserted between the message to the churches and the messages concerning the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. So it must be extremely important, the fact that Jesus speaks there in this one verse between the first three chapters and the last two chapters of Revelation. This message is especially for Seventh-day Adventists. You say, why is this? Because basically the terminology in Revelation 16 verse 15 
is a repetition of the terminology that is used in connection with the church of Laodicea, which is our church. Uh, let's read Revelation 3 verse 18 and you'll immediately see the connection. You notice that uh, in what we just read it says that we need to keep our garments lest we walk naked and they see our shame. Now notice the connection with the message to the church of Laodicea. It says the message to the, um, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Here you have the garments now. White garments that you may be clothed. And what's the purpose of the garments? That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So is there a dangerous, uh, danger that Laodicea will be found walking naked uh, in the context of the sixth plague? Yes, it's a message especially to the Laodicean church. Which we understand to be the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we don't say that proudly. Ellen White agrees. In volume 2 of Selected Messages, page 66, she says the message to the Laodiceans is applicable to Seventh-day Adventists who have had great light, and now notice this, and have not walked in the light. So in other words, it deals with action. Walking has to do with action. We're going to notice that. They have great light. They profess great light, but she says here that they have not walked in the light. It is those who have made great profession, but have not kept in step with their leader. In other words, they haven't walked with their leader. That will be spewed out of his mouth unless they repent. So there's a very real danger that Laodiceans will be found on the wrong side at the time of the sixth plague. And it has to do with righteousness by faith because it speaks about garments. And garments are related to righteousness by faith. How important is this message? It's a matter of life and death, folks, because the message to the Laodiceans is going to cause the shaking. And I believe it is causing the shaking. Notice Ellen White's comment at the bottom of this page, volume one of the testimonies, page 181. She says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this will cause a shaking among God's people. Powerful. So how important is Revelation 16 verse 15 and Revelation 3 verse 18? It will determine whether you stay in or whether you're shaken out. It's that important. Now let's go to uh, the page, the title where it says the context of Revelation 16 verse 15. By the way, I have a different page order. I have all of the material here. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to mainly go by titles. The context of Revelation 16 verse 15. Revelation 16, 12 portrays the moment that the sixth plague of the sixth plague after the close of probation when the persecuting waters of Babylon withdraw their support and turn against Babylon. So basically, uh, at the moment of the sixth plague, the waters, the multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples are about to drown God's people, basically. And the sixth plague simply means that the multitudes will be arrested. The waters will be dried up on Babylon. They will no longer support her. They'll turn against her. And they'll be in favor of God's people. That's the moment of the sixth plague. Now let's read this verse. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. That's Babylon's river. Spiritual Babylon at the end of time, by the way. And its water, that's multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, was dried up. That means that uh, the waters withdraw their support from Babylon. So that the way of the kings from the east, that's Jesus and his angels, might be prepared. So basically that's the message of the sixth plague. And then we have verses uh, 13 and 14. These verses go back in time toward the very end of probationary time when three counterfeit angels gather the wicked of the world on Satan's side. In other words, Revelation 16, 13, and 14 do not follow sequentially after verse 12. They take you back to before the close of probation. Are you following me? 
And you're going to see that in a minute. It comes forth clearly. The purpose of the gathering of the wicked waters is for them eventually to drown God's people. On the other hand, three holy angels will gather God's people on the Lord's side. So in other words, Revelation 16, 13 and 14 is speaking about the gathering of the wicked, the waters eventually to persecute God's people. On the other hand, we're going to notice that uh, God is gathering his people as well. Now, let's read this, the, these two verses. And I saw three, un, and I have explanations in brackets. I saw three unclean spirits. What are unclean spirits? Fallen angels, right? So they have three fallen angels. I, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. The dragon represents the secular powers of the world. Out of the mouth of the beast, which is the papacy. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, as represented in the United States. And then we find the reason why these three evil angels, so to speak, are, are uh, working through this threefold union. They have a specific purpose. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs, and here comes the purpose, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle, to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So what is the purpose of these three evil angels working through this threefold alliance? It is to gather the entire world on the devil's side against God's people. So there are two gatherings. You notice here, I have a little chart. You have a gathering of the righteous. Three holy angels gather the righteous to God's side. Does God also have three angels that proclaim messages to the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Revelation says that those individuals who are gathered on God's side follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They worship God. They are gathered to Jerusalem, spiritual Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is global at the end of time. It represents God's people all over uh, the world. And God's people receive the seal of God. On the other side, you have the gathering of the wicked. Three evil angels gather the wicked to Satan's side. Revelation says that they don't follow the lamb wherever he goes, they follow the beast. Instead of worshiping God, they worship the beast. Instead of being gathered to Jerusalem, they're gathered to Babylon. And instead of receiving the seal of God, they receive the mark of the beast. So verses 13 and 14 are speaking about events that take place before the close of probation. It takes you before in time uh, than what verse 12 is. Uh, now, uh, let me just read you a statement from Ellen White where she makes it very clear that these two verses refer to pre-close of probation events. Uh, this is found in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page, volume 7, page 983. She says, The present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Notice that uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It's gradually withdrawing from the world. And now notice the, term, the, the tense of the verb. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil. And now she's going to quote Revelation 16 verse 14 going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So is that gathering taking place now? The gathering of Revelation 16, 13, and 14? Absolutely, it's taking place now. And, the, and then by the time you get to the sixth plague, they're all gathered to destroy God's people. And that's when God is going to dry up the waters and the multitudes will withdraw their support from Babylon. Now, Revelation 16, 15, in other words, is a parenthetical statement that encourages God's people to prepare for the close of probation and to gather on the Lord's side for the final battle. Now, the Revelation 16, 15 is, is a parenthetical statement, a warning where God says, okay, the world is going to be gathered on two sides. Ultimately, the multitudes will withdraw their support from Babylon. Make sure that you're on the Lord's side. Make sure that you're in Jerusalem. Uh, this warning 
would be fruitless after the close of probation. Because by then all cases will have been decided. Right? The ESV, English Standard Version, puts this verse in parentheses, indicating that it breaks the flow of thought. This is clear from the context. Verse 14, I want you to notice the connect, there's a connection between verse 14 and verse 16. 15 is a parenthetical statement. Verse 14 ends with the word gather. And verse 16 picks up with the word gather. The expression, they gathered them, they is the three evil angels, they gathered them refers to the three counterfeit angels that gathered the wicked world on Satan's side. So let's read Revelation 16 and verse 14, skip verse 15 and read verse 16. It says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Are you, are you with me? So Revelation 16, 15, Jesus inserts that there. He says, listen, when this time comes, you make sure that you're on the right side. So it's a warning. Now let's analyze the terminology in Revelation 16, verse 15, and how it relates to righteousness by faith. I come as a thief. I come as a thief. You, we usually think of this as the second coming of Christ. It's not referring to the second coming of Christ. It's really referring to the close of probation. You see, if you go to Matthew 24, 37 to 39, you're going to find that Jesus compared the days of Noah to the coming of the Son of Man. That coming there does not refer only to the second coming. Because it goes on to say, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. There's two points of time there. There's two untils. The first until is when the door closes. And the second until is when it starts to rain. In between, the people didn't know that they were lost. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So uh, Jesus coming as a thief means people are, taken, are, are caught by surprise when probation closes. Notice what Ellen White had to say. She understood this. And this is only one statement of many. She understood that, that God's people are not, not to prepare for the second coming. They're to prepare for the close of probation. Because if you're not ready for the close of probation, you're not going to be ready for the second coming. I'm going to read this statement quickly. Powerful statement. Jesus has left us word. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. Uh, master of the house cometh at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Is that one of the words in Revelation 16, 15? Yeah, watch. And then she comments on this, on this verse where it speaks about the coming of the master and the surprise of the coming of the master. She says, we are, who would the we refer to there? Seventh-day Adventists, right? We are waiting and watching for the return of the master who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly he find us sleeping. And then she asks this question. What time is here referred to? What time is, is this referring to the coming of the master? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No! but to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary when he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And then she comments, when Jesus ceases to plead for man, that's a close of probation. The cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with his servants. And now notice the terminology, what the dangers are for Adventists, because she's talking to Adventists. To those who have neglected, not rejected, to those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness. Wow, that's sanctification, isn't it? To those who have neglected 
uh, she says, uh, the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them to be watching ones to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercession cease in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. And now notice, and those who have what? There it is again. Neglected to do what? To purify their souls by obeying the truth are found sleeping. Does obedience have anything to do with, uh, with watching and being ready for the coming of the Master? Oh yeah. It has to do with action. Then she, she says, they became weary of waiting and watching. They became indifferent. Are you noticing the terminology? Neglected, weary, indifferent regarding the coming of their master. They longed not for his appearing. Do you long for his appearing? I mean, long for his appearing. They long not for his appearing. And thought there was no need of such continued, persevering watching. They had been disappointed in their expectations and might be again. They concluded that there was time enough yet to arouse. They would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. It would be safe to get all of this world they could. And in securing this object, they lost all anxiety and interest in the appearing of their master. They became, notice the terminology again, they became indifferent and careless as though his coming were yet in the distance. By, but while their interest was buried up in their worldly gains, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary and they were unprepared. So what is meant here by I come as a thief? It's speaking about the close of probation. And those who are indifferent and careless and don't long for the second coming of Christ, they're Adventists. You know, they go to church on Sabbath and they believe all the doctrines of the Adventist church, but they have not purified their soul by obedience to the truth. So somehow the message of Revelation 16 verse 15 has to do with obedience to the truth. Now the next uh, word that we need to analyze is the word watch. And I'm not going to read all these texts. I'm just going to refer to some of them. Jesus says, I'm coming as a thief, therefore watch. What did he mean by watch? Well, basically, uh, the word means to be alert. To be awake. To be aware. To be vigilant. For that we have to be studying, don't we? And we have to be praying. Remember when Jesus told the disciples, why don't you pray? I'm going to go pray. You pray with me. Watch. What did they do? They slept. They were totally unaware of what was happening because they were sleeping. At the conclusion of the parable of the ten virgins, you have this Matthew 25 verse 13. Jesus says, watch. By the way, this is when the, when the door closes. Remember the door closes? That's not the second coming. In the parable of the virgins, the closing of the door is not the second coming. Because after this, those who don't have enough oil have time to go and try and look for more oil. <laughs> it refers to the moment when the door of probation closes. And notice, notice the warning that Jesus gives in, in Matthew 25, 13. This is the last verse of the parable of the ten virgins. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And this is not talking about the second coming. It's talking about the coming of Jesus to close the door of probation. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, just imagine that you live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> I lived at Andrews University. It is freezing here in the, in the winter and lots of snow. And, uh, you know, you've, you've just come home and you've changed into your pajamas and you know you put the thermostat down and so you get into bed and you're nice and warm under the covers say oh I'm looking forward to a good night's sleep and then you remember say uh oh I forgot to lock the door you say oh I just I, I hate to get up out of this bed it's so warm ah I've lived in this house 25 years and the thief has never come <laughs> And that night, while everybody in the house is sleeping, the thief comes. Are the people in the house aware that the thief came? Because they're sleeping. When do they find out that the thief has come? When they wake up the next morning. But then it's too late. 
You have two, two moments of time there. You have the moment when the thief comes and the people are surprised, but they don't know it. And then when they actually find out that the thief came, but then it's too late. Are you understanding my point? So what does it mean to watch? Well, to watch means simply to be alert, to be awake, to be vigilant, to be studying, to be praying, uh, you know, to be witnessing to other people. It means to be active in the things of the Lord in the light of where we are. Revelation 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you have received and, uh, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch... I will come upon you as a thief. See, this is a connection with Revelation 16, 15 again. I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So we understand now what it means to the Jesus coming as a thief. We know what it means to watch. What does it mean to keep the garments, to keep well, that word, the Greek word tereo, means to preserve, to protect, or to safeguard. To preserve, to protect, or to safeguard. According to the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament, it means, now listen carefully, keeping or preserving the unblemished nature of a person or a condition. So must the person be in an unblemished condition in order to be able to keep that unble unblemished con condition? Absolutely. Very, very important. Now, the Apostle Paul uses this, uh, this word, keep. Incidentally, it's the same word that says, here are they who keep the commandments of God. Um, the Apostle Paul says, I have kept the faith at the end of his life. What does he mean when he says, I have kept the faith? I've stayed faithful until the end, right? So he accepted the faith, and at the very end, he's still faithful to the uh, faithful. Paul also encouraged the Ephesians to keep unity. Must they have been united before in order to keep unity? Of course. So if you're supposed to keep your garments, must you have received those garments before? Absolutely. And then uh, Jude 6 speaks about the rebel angels who did not keep their place in heaven. See, they were in heaven, but they didn't keep their place. So what is meant by keep? Keeping the garments. It means persevering until the end. It means that you at one point received a white garment, but you're supposed to what? But you're supposed to persevere in it. I should have turned this off. I tell my church members to turn it off every Sabbath. And I tell them that... Uh, if any cell phone that sounds uh, will be confiscated and sold and the proceeds will be given for church budget. <laughs> but uh, we are not in my church. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's off now. Uh, so I understand what it means to keep. In order to keep, you must have received before. So it may, it is speaking about perseverance, it's speaking about obedience, it's speaking about remaining faithful even till the end. Now, the next point that we find in this verse is, um, you know, walking, keeping your garments so that you don't walk naked and they see your shame. So we need to ask the question, what does walk mean? When the word walk is used in a spiritual sense in Scripture, it always refers to behavior or conduct. So gar do garments have anything to do with conduct? Keeping the garments, does that have anything to do with behavior, with living a sanctified life? It does, absolutely. Let me give you some examples. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. Is that behavioral? Yes, it is. 1 John 2, 6. You can repeat this one from memory. He who says he abides in him ought himself awful to walk just as he walked. Does that have to do with, uh, with life, uh, conduct, behavior? Absolutely. 
Hebrews 11 verse 5 says that Enoch walked with God. And he was not. God took him because he walked with God. And the book of Genesis says that he pleased God. Amen. His life, his life revealed that his faith was genuine. But you know, uh, the wicked also walk. <laughs> Notice Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. So does a walk there have to do with behavior? Uh, it has to do with wicked behavior here. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once, notice, what's the next word? Conducted. Does that have to do with conduct or behavior? Yes, conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And then Colossians 3, 6, and 7 says, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of what? Disobedience, which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So does walking have to do with conduct or behavior? So does Revelation 16, 15 have anything to do with, with when you're covered with the garments that you're going to walk the way the Lord walked? And the wicked are going to walk in a contrary way? Absolutely. Now notice the message to the church of Sardis, Revelation 3, verses 4 through 6. Here it connects actually with the garments. It says, therefore, if you will not watch, that's a word that we found in Revelation 16, 15, I will come upon you as a, that's there also, as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And then it says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not what? Defiled their garments. Must they have had white garments in order to be able to defile them? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So it says, uh, and um, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall what? Walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. This is speaking about the future. By the way, now we wear spiritual white garments. But then we will have literal white garments of light. And, uh, you know, I might make a parenthesis here. The idea of garments and light is really interesting. You know, Ellen White says that Adam and Eve were covered with robes of light. White robes of light in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. The, 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 the garments were literal, literal garments of white, white light. But those garments of light symbolized their righteousness. They were righteous because they were obedient. Now when they sinned, what did they lose first? Their spiritual robe or their literal robe? They lost righteousness, right? Because the robe represents righteousness. They, they lost righteousness. And so when they lost their spiritual robe, what happened with the robe of light? It went away too. The literal robe of light left. So how does God restore the robe? He first of all restores which robe? He first of all covers you with his spiritual robe of light. And then when Jesus comes, he'll give you the literal robe of light. So first you lose your spiritual and then you lose your literal robe. When Jesus restores, he restores your spiritual robe. And then when he comes, he will give you the literal robe. And this is speaking about when Jesus will give his literal robe. Uh, so it says in verse, uh, once again, verse 4, You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, before his angels. So the robe that is being talked about in Revelation 16, verse 15, yes, it has to do with imputed righteousness. There, there, there can be no holy life unless Christ imputes his righteousness to us. But the emphasis that is being presented here in Revelation 16, verse 15, is the life that flows from justification. Now I want to read some statements that make this clear uh, in the book of Revelation. Revelation 19, verse 8. Speaking about the church, 
in the white garments. Notice. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And now notice what the clean linen represents. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What does a, I thought the white raiment represents the righteousness of Christ. It is, but the righteousness of Christ is imputed and it is also imparted. This is speaking about his imparted righteousness. Because you have to have the imputed in order to receive the imparted. But it's interesting, it says the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Notice Revelation 22 verse 11. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Let the evildoer still do evil. Action. And the filthy still be filthy. And the righteous still what? Do right. Notice that the emphasis is on action. Still do right. And the holy still be holy. Now I want to read you some statements from Ellen White. Very interesting statements. Christ Object Lessons 3.10. Actually, that whole chapter is phenomenal. She says, By the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. So God's uh, people will possess Christ's what? <laughs> character. To the church it is given that she, now she's going to quote the verse that we just mentioned, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteous Ness of saints, the righteousness of saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character, that through faith is, what's the next word? Not imputed, is imparted to all who receive him as their personal savior. So the emphasis is upon the impartation of Christ's character. Now, notice the next paragraph. Notice in the following statement that the fig leaf garment is synonymous with nakedness and the deformity of sin. That is, to cover ourselves with our own righteousness is equivalent to nakedness. This is the reason why when Adam and Eve sinned, they still felt naked and ashamed even after they had covered themselves with the fig leaves. <laughs> Yeah, they cover themselves and then they're hiding. God says, where are you? Oh, we're, we, we were afraid because we're naked. But they weren't naked. They had the fig leaves. But to have fig leaves is to be naked. Yeah. Notice this next statement. By his perfect obedience, he has made it impossible. impossible. Oh, thank you very much. He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Amen. And then comes the secret. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged with his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig garment, fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin. So the fig garment is what? Fig leaf garment is what? The nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. You know, there's a lot of discussion about the 1888 message. There's one little short statement here from Ellen White that synthesizes what it was. <laughs> You know, it's not rocket science. It doesn't take an encyclopedia. <laughs> Testimonies to Ministers 91 and 92, she says, The 1888 message presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. <laughs> See the balance? Justification is man. How do you how do you know a person is justified? It's manifested by what? By obedience to all of God's commandments. I love this statement in Review and Herald, June 4, 1895. She says, "Righteousness within is testified by righteousness without." So, if you're righteous within, the the testimony that that's true is by 
you're outside. Then she says, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. Imputed means that it is credited to our account. It is not ours, it's his righteousness. That's imputed is a theological term. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. In other words, it becomes part and parcel of us because we reflect the character of Christ. She says the first is our title to heaven or our right to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. Is Jesus going to take anyone to heaven who's not fit? No. Let me ask you, would it be possible, do you think, that someone could get a driver's license who doesn't know how to drive? Yeah, I think so. If he knows the right people, get a driver's license. That would, give him, that would give him the right to drive, but he doesn't have the fitness. Do you think there's anybody who, has, who knows how to drive but doesn't have a driver's license? Of course. What do you need? You need the right to drive and you need to know how to do it in order to drive. And so it is, in order to make it to heaven, we not only need to have what Ellen White calls the title to heaven, but we need to have the fitness for heaven. Justification and sanctification. Yes. Uh, maybe we'll, a little bit at the end. Let's save them for the end. Now, the book of Revelation describes the end time generation. In Revelation 7, 1 through 8, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, and Revelation 15, 2 through 4. Revelation 7 describes the sealing of the 144,000. Revelation 14 describes the sterling character of 144,000. And interestingly enough, Revelation 15 describes their victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. So three emphases. Revelation 7, the sealing. Revelation 14, the character. Revelation 15, the victory over the beast, his image, and his mark. Have you ever noticed that Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, you know, the previous verses speak about the second coming of Christ. You know, people are going to be hiding in caves. They're going to cry for the rocks to fall upon them. And then the, the verse, verse 17, ends with a question. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The very next verse speaks of the sealing of the 144,000. Now I want to show you several other verses that ask that same question. Who? And you're going to see that always when the who is asked, it's followed by a sterling character. Joel 2 verse 11. This is not in your material, so uh, you know the, just the references are, but not, uh, not the text. In Joel chapter 2 verses 1, 1 through 10, you have the second coming as described. You can read those verses. And then verse 11 says, The Lord gives voice before his army. This is the Lord coming with the, with, on the white horse, with the white horses following him at the second coming. For his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Remember that Revelation 6 verse 17 says, For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Now notice, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? If you read beginning with verse 12 through verse 17, it uses day of atonement terminology. It speaks about the sounding of the trumpet. It speaks about afflicting the soul. Being the porch and the altar, altar crying out, Lord, spare your people. It speaks about fasting. All events that took place on the Day of Atonement. In other words, now is not a time for the church to be jumping up and down in church and rolling in the aisles. Now we are on the Day of Atonement. It's a time of affliction, examining the life. The celebration will come in the Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> but the Day of Atonement is a solemn day of heart searching to make sure that our life is in harmony with the law of the Lord. Notice Psalm 15. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Listen to the answer. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness 
and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does he evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, doesn't take advantage of people, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Are those all behavioral characteristics? Yes. And then notice the last verse. He who does these things shall never be moved. <laughs> who will be able to stand? These people. Isaiah 6, uh, 33 asks the same question. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And then comes the question, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? You know, and usually, if you ask that question of somebody who's not an animal, they say, oh, the wicked, they're going to burn in the fires forever. No, it's the righteous that will live in the midst of the fire forever. Because the wicked are not fireproof. <laughs> the fire is eternal. Because the fire is the glory of God. So the fire never goes out. But that doesn't mean that what it burns doesn't go out. <laughs> and so now notice the answer. Who will dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Here comes the answer. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly he to it who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Are those all behavioral characteristics? characteristics? Yes. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Ellen White quotes that text in the context of the time of trouble. One final verse where the question is asked. Psalm 24 verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Remember that the 144,000 are standing on Mount Zion, right? Which is the Lord's hill. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean heart, hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Are you seeing the emphasis on sanctification? Now, righteousness by faith and verity. We only have uh, like 25 minutes, but we're going to try and get through this so that you see the gist of it. I hope you'll read the rest of it. Ellen White in uh, Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, said this, wrote this, Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. So the third angel's message is a message of what? Righteousness by faith. But when you read the third angel's message, I don't know, for a long time I struggled to find righteousness by faith in, that ver in those verses. And I think, that, uh, I think that I know now what Ellen White meant. Revelation 14, 9 through 12, let's read those verses. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Of course, the question is, what possible relationship does this passage have with righteousness by faith? It certainly is not describing forensic justification. You don't understand what I mean by forensic justification? It's not, it's not speaking about imputed righteousness here. Let me ask you, what's the time of trouble going to be like? Ellen White says that the most vivid imagination cannot grasp what it's going to be like. Because basically the devil is going to be in total control of planet earth except God is going to say, you can't kill my people. The story of Job is going to be repeated. 
God's people are going to lose everything. And Satan is going to torture them with the idea that their sins have been so great that they, that they can't be accepted. So you better make sure that, you're, that you've repented of sin, that you've confessed your sins, that they've gone into the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Because the devil's going to try to convince you that your sins are too big that Jesus, Jesus didn't forgive you. And Ellen White says that if you, if you come to the point where you believe that Jesus didn't forgive you, you're sunk. Because it's, because it's trusting in the promise of God that, that God forgave your sins, that even though you don't feel forgiven, she says you look at the, the, the righteous will look at their lives and they don't see anything good. But they claim the promises of God. It's like Jesus when he was on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was bearing the sins of the world. If he had gone by feelings, he would have failed. But Jesus, Ellen White says, that Jesus on the cross did not trust his feelings where the devil was saying, you're going to be separated from your father forever because you're bearing the sins of the world. It's too offensive to God. You're never going to see your father's face. You're not going to see beyond the portals of the tomb. Ellen White says that Jesus at that moment claimed the promises of his father. And he ignored his feelings. Isn't it true that many of our problems come because we're always caught up in our feelings? rather than the promises of God. Now I'm going to skip this uh, section that deals with martyrs of the past and of the future. You can read that. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but I want to go to the part where it says Daniel and his three friends. So we understand righteousness by faith and the third angel's message. Ellen White, when she talks about righteousness by faith in the third angel's message, she's referring primarily to Righteousness by faith exhibited in faithfulness in the life. She's talking about the sanctification. She's talking about faithfulness. Now let's go through this very quickly. The three young friends of Daniel are examples of the end time generation. The story of the three young men is fulfilled on a global scale in Revelation. The third angel's message is actually a globalization of this story because the same elements are present in both. Did Nebuchadnezzar for a while behave as a beast? Hmm. Did he raise up an image? Did he command everyone to worship the image? Did he threaten any, everyone who was not willing to worship the image? Does that sound like Revelation 13? Absolutely. Ellen White, in fact, links the story of Daniel 3 with the end time crisis. In Manuscript Releases, volume 14, page 91, she says, an idle Sabbath has been set up as the golden image was set up in the plains of Dura. And as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. So the crisis is going to be very similar. It's going to be global. Now how did Daniel and his three friends reveal that they had experienced righteousness by faith? The answer is, folks, that their faithfulness exhibited their faith. So the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in the sense that those who go through this crisis will exhibit their faith through faithfulness. The three young men revealed their trust and allegiance to Christ by their faithfulness, even in the face of death. In Youth Instructor, July 12, 1904, Ellen White says the three Hebrews were called upon to confess Christ in the face of the burning, fiery furnace. It cost them something to do this, for their lives were at stake. These youth, imbued with the Holy Spirit, declared to the whole kingdom of Babylon their what? Their faith. How, how did they show that they had faith? By, be, by being willing to die, right? So she says, these youth, imbued with the Holy Spirit, declared to the whole kingdom of Babylon their faith, that he whom they worship was the only true and living God. The demonstration of their faith on the plains of Dura was a most eloquent presentation of their principles. The demonstration of their faith. Because of their faith, the young men were delivered. Just like God's people will be delivered because they don't worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark or the number of his name. Significantly, this is important, significantly the word deliver is used in only three contexts in the book of Daniel. 
Daniel 3, Daniel 6, and Daniel 12, verse 1. Those are the only places in Daniel where the word deliver is used. So they must be related, right? So let's read this passage, Daniel 3, 16 to 18, verse 28 and verse 29. And uh, it says there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve. See, it, what is the emphasis? Yeah, they, 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 they have been made righteous, righteous by faith, but how is that exhibited? By their words and their actions. Our God in whom we... Uh, whom we serve is able to what? That's a key word. Deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, see they don't serve the Lord for the, for the loaves and the fishes. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, uh, this is after the crisis. Nebuchadnezzar uh, spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, who was by, Jesus, by the way, and here comes the key word, and what? Delivered his servants who? What's a synonym of trust? Faith. Who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Does the third angel's message have anything to do with being faithful to God in a crisis like this? Absolutely. So it's righteousness, imputed righteousness, manifested in faithfulness to God. Verse 29, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So the word deliver is used four times in the context of Daniel 3, which is symbolic of the end time. Incidentally, do you know that Hebrews 11, verses 33 and 34, clearly says that by faith, the three young men quenched the fire. That's not talking about imputed righteousness. It's talking about faithfulness. Because they know Jesus, because they have experienced the righteousness of Jesus, they are faithful. So Hebrews 11, 33 and 34 underlines the fact that the three young men quenched the fire, fire through faith. This indicates that their faith was more than intellectual assent, more than believing something in their heads, more than a juridical act of imputation. True faith is exhibited in faithfulness. This is righteousness by faith in the end time. You understand a little better the connection with the third angel's message? Now let's talk about Daniel. You can read the next statement. It uses expressions such as stand steadfastly for the right, stand unmoved, put their trust in him. See the emphasis on faith and faithfulness. What about Daniel and the lions then? Another passage that illustrates righteousness by faith in the end time crisis is the story found in Daniel 6. This story is an illustration of the crisis that will come as a result of the violation of the free exercise clause. I won't get into that, but uh, really these two experiences, Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, are an illustration of the establishment clause and the free exercise clause of, a, of the First Amendment to the Constitution. What happens when the establishment and free exercise clauses are violated? The very existence of Daniel was put in jeopardy because of his worship practices and the law of his God. Are we going to see that crisis all over again? Absolutely. Notice Daniel, we'll read several texts from Daniel. Daniel 6 verse 5, Then these men, the enemies of Daniel, said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Is that what the end time crisis is about? Oh, absolutely. Now notice the following verses. So the king gave command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, now notice here, your God whom you, what? Serve continually. So what is the emphasis here? The fact that he depends on the Lord consistently. He will what? There's the key word, deliver you. And then after he comes back to the lion's den, 
the next morning, and when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve what? Continually been able to deliver you from the lions. And then the king says, he delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. See the emphasis on deliver? What kind of people is God going to deliver in the end time? Those who not only have faith, but are faithful. That's connection with third angel. See, the third angel's message says, you're going to have a crisis over the beast, his image, and his mark. And you're going to have to choose whether you will be faithful to God, even having to die. And that will show you, you truly have faith and trust in Jesus. Is that righteousness by faith? Whoo. In verity, as Ellen White said. Now when the trial was over, Daniel explained, he says, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found, what? Innocent before him and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Is that behavioral? Yes. By the way, do you know that Hebrews 11 also refers to this? It says that by faith, Daniel shut the mouths of lions. By faith. Really, by faithfulness. Now let's talk about Paul and James quickly. At this point, it might be well to ask, does Paul's definition of righteousness by faith conflict with that of James? Are you, are you with me? I hope so, because I, I have... A, Extra, extra stuff here. Did Paul believe that man is made righteous by a forensic act of God while James believed that man is made righteous by holy life? Not at all. Faith and works are a package deal. Neither can exist without the other. In order to be genuine, faith must be active. Faith is an action word. Paul was looking at the motivating force of works and James was looking at the result of true faith. Paul was looking at the root, and James was looking at the fruit. True faith is an uncompromising trust in Jesus that translates into obedient faithfulness. In other words, faith is faithful. James presented two examples of faith, Abraham and Rahab. Did Abraham act on his faith? When God said, leave, what did, what did uh, he do? What did Abraham do? He said, pack up, Sarah, we're leaving. How about when God asked him to sacrifice his son? That, did that take faith? Oh, yeah. How about Rahab? It says, by faith she received the spice. So, well, how much faith is it in receiving the spice? Folks, if they had discovered that she had the spice, she would have been killed. In fact, Patriarchs and Prophets 482 and 43 says, The inhabitants of the city, terrified and suspicious, were constantly on the alert, and the messengers were in great danger. They were, however, preserved by Rahab, a woman of Jericho, at the peril of her own life. In return for her kindness, they gave her a promise of protection when the city should be taken. So Rahab is given as an example. And, and you know, James, some people don't like James. You know, how, when is James quoted? When you talk about righteousness by faith, hardly ever. Because James says, Rahab, was not Rahab justified by works? <laughs> was not Abraham our father justified by works? And don't, don't think that James and Paul are contradicting each other. No. Uh, James is looking at the fruit of faith. He's looking at, at, you know, what proves that faith is genuine. Whereas... Paul is looking at the saving act of faith. In fact, let's notice in the next paragraph. The heroes and heroines of Hebrews 11 did not merely believe in something. They believed in someone. They were acting in trust upon God's word. Their faith was made complete by their works. The emphasis in Hebrews 11 is not primarily upon imputed righteousness, but rather upon the faithful, obedient life that flows from a saving relationship with Christ. True faith always leads to faithfulness. Faithless works will not save a person, and a workless faith will not save him either. Faith is the invisible side of works, and works are the visible side of faith. Faith is the internal propelling force, and works are the external manifestation. 
the heroes and heroines of Hebrews 11 are doing something. Notice the list. Abel offered, Enoch pleased, Noah built, Abraham lift, Abraham offered, Isaac and Jacob blessed, Moses was hidden, which was an act of faith because it was a crime. Moses refused, Moses left, Moses kept, Israel passed, Israel marched, Rahab hid. Somehow I, want, I, I think God is trying to tell us that faith is an action word. Now let's go to where it says Daniel 12 verse 1. It's a little bit further ahead. Daniel 12 verse 1. This is the only other place in Daniel where the word deliver is used. Interesting. Daniel 3, the three young men who stood before the image of the beast and didn't, um, didn't worship. Daniel 6, where Daniel is thrown into the lion's den because of his worship practices. And now we come to the end time fulfillment of Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 in, in Daniel 12 verse 1. At that time Michael shall stand up. That refers to the close of probation. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. That's a crisis over the beast, his image and his mark, folks. Time of trouble. Where the lives of God's people will be in danger. But then notice, and at that time, your people shall be what? There's the word. Is there a connection between Daniel 3, 6, and 12? Absolutely. Your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. After the close of probation, God's people will go through the same experience as Daniel and his three friends, but on a global scale. The faith of God's people will be exhibited by their faithfulness and loyalty to God. That's the connection with the third angel's message. Faith without faithfulness is not really faith. Now here comes an important paragraph. Some Adventist scholars are soteriological dualists. Say, so what does that mean? The word soteriology means salvation. When it comes to salvation, they're dualists. But they are anthropological monists. In other words, uh, when it comes to the doctrine of man, they, they are not dualists, they're monists. Single unity. You know, like evangelists, they'll say, you know, uh, the body and the breath makes one person. Living soul. But when it comes to righteousness by faith, we say, faith alone, no works. That's that's dualism, soteriological dualism. Because there's no such thing. People are not saved by, by faith alone. They're saved by a faith that works. Amen. And sometimes we just totally depreciate works. So it works. They count for nothing. Ellen White warned uh, uh, Jones and White said, listen, I understand what you're saying, but you need to be, you need to be clear on what you're saying about this. Well, say, well, they certain Adventist scholars say that man is saved by faith alone without works. They also say that the body alone cannot live without the spirit. But James makes it clear that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead as well. So is man justified by faith or by works is the question. How do we reconcile these two? The only way is showing that James is teaching that faith is shown by faithfulness and obedience, even to the point of death. Justification is exhibited in sanctification. Faith is revealed uh, in Abraham being willing to slay his own son and Rahab being willing to risk her life in loyalty even to the point of death. Now, um, I'm going to jump to where it says the book of Ephesians. I want to leave it just a couple of minutes for questions. The book of Ephesians. Uh, you can read that paragraph. You know, that book is divided into three key words summarize that book. Sit walk and stand. Watchman Nee actually wrote a book many years ago and the title of the book is Sit, Walk, Stand. See, first of all, you're, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places because it's His righteousness. So when we're seated and resting in Christ, then we walk. And when we walk with Him, we're able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
So basically that summarizes what, what we've been talking about. Now, how can, this, how can this experience be real in our lives? Well, there's a section here that says how. I'm just going to end by reading these two statements, one from the Bible and the other from the Spirit of Prophecy. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he just talked about all of those who, have, who had faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So one thing we have to do is lay aside sin. And let us what? Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Does that involve action? Those who have run in marathons know that they run with endurance the race that is set before us. And, and, and then notice what it says. Looking unto what? There it is. Unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Why was Jesus able to endure the cross? Because of the joy that was set before him. Seeing, seeing everyone saved in his kingdom. Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, volume 5 of the Testimonies, 202 and 203. There's one number missing there. Ellen White says, it says, A deadly spiritual malady is upon the church. Its members are wounded by Satan, but they will not look to the cross of Christ as the Israelites looked to the brazen serpent that they may live. The world has so many claims upon them, listen carefully, the world has so many claims on them that they have not time to look at the cross of Calvary long enough to see its glory or to feel its power. So it has to do with the length of your looking. When they now and then catch a glimpse of the self-denial and self-dedication which the truth demands it is unwelcome and they turn their attention in another direction that they may the sooner forget it. Wow. So it's dwelling, it's abiding in Christ. Keeping your eyes on Him. Not a glance here and there. But constantly keeping our eyes on Him. And you know when we keep our eyes on Jesus you know what happens? First of all we see how evil we are. And we cry out when we look at Jesus and say, man, he's so holy and perfect, I'm, I'm undone. But then, as you look at the cross, you say, but wait a minute. Jesus was willing to die on the cross to save me from my sin. So there's hope. So when you look at the holiness of Jesus, we see our unholiness. But when we look at the cross, we see what Jesus has done to rescue us from our sinfulness. So the whole key is keeping our eyes on Jesus. And you know, that's what Enoch did. If you read about Enoch in Patriarchs and Prophets, <laughs> it always says that he walked with the Lord day by day, closer and closer, built on him through prayer, through, through uh, you know, through communion with him, through entering into communication with the people that surround him. And he drew so close to Jesus that Jesus said, Enoch, you know, there's no use me walking up here and you walking down there. Come on up here to the New Jerusalem. We'll walk together in the street of gold. That's what God is waiting for. And that is included in righteousness by faith. I hope you study the section on the martyrs past and future. Revelation 5, the fifth seal. It speaks about the martyrs of the past during the 1260 years. And the martyrs of the future. By the way, some people will lose their lives because they did not worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. Revelation 20 verse 4 makes that clear. But that's during the short time of trouble before the close of probation. So folks, bottom line is, let's spend quality time with our Lord. Amen. By beholding, we are changed. If we contemplate the world, we'll be like the world. If we behold Christ and keep our eyes focused on Him, we will be like Jesus. There is power, transforming power, in the life of and in the cross of Christ. Let's pray. And then we'll take a couple of questions. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the beauty of your holy word. We thank you that in spite of our sinfulness and our wicked sinful nature, uh, you have made everything uh, possible for us not only to receive the imputed righteousness of Christ, but to live the life of Christ in our everyday walk. Father, we long to have that experience with Jesus. Help us, Lord, to abide in him, to focus on him, 
to speak about him, to pray to him, to study his word that we might learn more about him. Help us, Lord, to stay close to Jesus, closer each day. We thank you, Father, for having been with us, for answering our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you had a question? The imparted, the imparted righteousness is the Holy Spirit working in our life to reproduce the character of Christ in our life. That's, the, you know, when, we, when we're baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit begins to form within us, Christ within us, which is the hope of glory. So, uh, you know, uh, yes, if I consent, that's right. Okay, yes. With Righteousness by faith is the third angel's message of Uh yeah, yeah, it's in the material. Well, it says justification by faith. Does she ever, in, in any place, say righteousness by faith? Well, the thing is, the word, the word justification and righteousness are used interchangeably in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. In Spanish, this. In Spanish, there's only one word, uh -huh. justificación. You should know that. <laughs> we have a distinction between justification and sanctification. Yeah, but all of it is included in righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is not only justification by faith, it includes a broader spectrum of everything together. Now, our works do not have any merit, but our works reveal if our experience with Christ has been genuine or not. And that's what's going to happen in the third angel's message. Our faithfulness in not worshiping the beast as image or receiving the mark shows that we have a saving relationship with Christ. We've received his imputed righteousness, which is manifested in a holy life. It's a package deal, in other words. Oh, yes, please. Uh, of all the Christians, your Adventist living before Jesus comes. Now, I understand that only the 144,000 Oh, will be saved of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, Alive. Right. So, it would be only the vast multitude coming in that will be martyred. I mean, the 144,000 will not be martyred. Right? The 144,000 will uh, not die. They will go through the time of trouble and they will be alive when Jesus comes. And there will be no more Adventists there, there will be, oh yeah, there will be all of those so, I mean, living. No, the, but you know, and whether the number 144,000 is literal or symbolic, I believe it's a symbolic number. But what I tell people is that's not the important point. The important point is if you're living in that period, make sure you're in that group. <laughs> because it's not that, you know, we can debate the number and lose our Christianity over debating the number. Yes? Uh, I see a big issue concerning the, the nature of Christ. And I would like to know um, how important it is for us to have a true understanding of the nature of Christ together with righteousness by faith and, and what it is the, the true about this. Yeah. Well, the nature of Christ, uh, the question is about the nature of Christ and whether it has a relationship with righteousness by faith, and I believe it does. Um, because, you know, if Christ, I believe that Christ had a regenerated sinful nature. In other words, he was not, he was not born uh, the way that we're born. Because if Jesus had born just, been born just with a sinful, unaided na nature, he could not have overcome. So Jesus uh, basically received uh, a regenerated, sinful nature, and through the power of God, he overcame sin. The question is, um, is it possible for us to live the life that Christ lived and totally and completely over sin, overcome sin in thought as well as in action. Ellen White makes it clear in the chapter on the time of trouble that it is possible. Uh, you know, there are those who say that we're going to continue sinning until Jesus comes. And uh, you ask them why, we'll say, you know, because man has a sinful nature and the flesh is weak. But, but you know, when you really think about it, when you use that argument, you're not really saying that the flesh is weak you're saying that God is not strong. What you're saying is that your flesh is more powerful than God. You're saying that your sinful nature is more powerful than God. Um, 
you know, the Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. Not some things or most things, but all things through Christ who strengthens us. The reason why we don't overcome the way Jesus overcame is because we're not fulfilling the same conditions that he fulfilled. That is, he was constantly close to his Father through a study of nature, through the written scriptures, which he himself had inspired, by the way, and uh, through, uh, through witnessing to others. You know, one of the ways that we can draw closest to Christ is when we see Christ in others. Yes. You know, one has this amazing statement where she says that, uh, you know, some people think that it would be such a blessing to visit the Holy Land. And they'd be closer to Christ by visiting the Holy Land. The other way says, you don't have to go to the Holy Land to be closer to Christ. Just visit the leprosariums and just visit the shut-ins and visit people in prison. You know, there you're close to Christ. Because in that you have done it unto one of these, at least my brethren, you have done it unto me. So working in practical terms for other people draws us so close to Christ because we are having fellowship with him in, his, uh, in the work that he did. So, you know, the, I call it the triangle of sanctification. Prayer, Bible study, and witnessing. You know, but we don't dedicate enough time to all this. It's only a passing glance, as I read. You know, we, uh, we have maybe our worship in the morning. You know, we read the morning watch, or we study our Sabbath school lesson, and the rest of the day, you know, we go without thinking much about Christ, and by the time we get to the evening, you know, we have our little worship in the evening and have our prayer, and then the next day, it's the same routine all over again. Our life has to be... Uh, has to be uh, colored with Christ from our waking moment to our, to our sleeping moment. As the statement said, our, the happiness of those who serve God come from the people that they serve and the people they help. So when we see them happy, you know, we're yes. happy. Yes. You know, and um, you know, one, another thing in which we draw closer to Christ is through suffering. Fellowship in His sufferings. Because, you know, when, when we suffer, we should be praising the Lord. Because we're, experience what Jesus, we're experiencing what Jesus experienced. Uh, and I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about suffering that we, necessarily that is due to our, own <laughs> to our own causes or reasons. I'm talking about suffering for righteousness' sake. Because we understand the experience that Jesus went through. Uh, so, um, any other questions or comments? Yeah, Kevin. When it was asking the question about the connection of Christ there, uh, and, and your own comment about Jesus having a regenerated sinful nature, I have written a, a, an article that some people here may have read. It's titled The Lower and Higher Natures The Key to Resolving the Adventist Christology Debate. And it is online, uh, assuming we get our website up and running again. And that's the website greatcontroversy.org. But if any of you happen to run into me, I can give you my card and I'll send you a copy. Anything that Kevin has written is good stuff. Good stuff. Kevin Paulson. Kevin Paulson. Fellow member of the Theology of Ordination Committee of the GC. We worked together for quite a long time. Still are. So anyway, well, thanks for coming, folks. Blessings to you all. Please check out our Secrets Unsealed booth. We have a booth here. Uh, so please check us out. Come by. I'll be there. Have a chance to talk with you. Get acquainted. Uh, God bless you all. Thanks for coming.